Thank you, Caitlin. Um, and thank you to LPI for inviting us to give a talk about FreeBSD. So uh, like Caitlin said, I'm Deb Goodcan and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And I want to introduce you to FreeBSD. So I assume that people who are attending this webinar uh, may have never heard of FreeBSD, or there may be people who work with Linux and are curious about FreeBSD, and or people who uh, want to get into tech and uh, want to get their hands dirty with an open source project or an operating system. And so, um, so anyway, so hopefully you'll learn something uh, by watching this talk, and um, and we'll be interested in contributing after I finish. So we'll get started. Hopefully everyone can see my screen okay, or my slides. Uh, so a little bit who I am. I, so Caitlin just basically um, introduced me and said who I am. So I have been with the foundation uh, since August of 2015, so quite a long time. And before that, I was a firmware engineer and I worked on various aspects of uh, disk drives. So I was from the storage world. and. I, I think of myself as a curiositor, so that's uh, a new word that I made up, though I, I believe it's in the Urban Dictionary. And, um, and so I use it to describe myself because I'm curious and I'm an avid learner and I always want to just learn about different things. So right now I spend that time focusing more on open source and FreeBSD uh, to help me better understand it. And so I can share my knowledge with people like you. So the goals of my of the webinar today uh, is to describe what FreeBSD is and, and why people use it, uh, how the project works, and, um, and why you should use it and contribute to FreeBSD. And if we have time at the end, I will have a Q&A session. And, um, and I don't have all the answers. And, um, you know, and, and I'm not technical in operating systems. I have a technical background, but it's an area I'm still learning. Uh, and so hopefully I can provide answers later on. So what is FreeBSD? So I say this, I point this out because even though it's 2020, people still get confused about FreeBSD and, and they hear about it and they assume it's another Linux distribution, but it's not. So uh, the reason why I point this out is because um, here's an example of a large open source company. Uh, OpenSource.com is actually owned by Red Hat, and they put out the survey late last year. And uh, they're asking people what their favorite Linux distribution was, and they included FreeBSD. And so it really, and, and I know why they did it, because they know that FreeBSD is popular and they wanted to include it, but it just, you know, keeps the confusion out there. And so uh, that's why we constantly have to, you know, explain to people or just make sure that people understand that FreeBSD is a, a totally different operating system. So I view the FreeBSD world as three main or primary components. And so on the top right is the actual operating system that you'd be running on your computer. In the middle, it's the, the project, it's the community of people who create FreeBSD. And on the bottom is the FreeBSD Foundation, which I'm a part of, and, um, and we're here uh, to support the FreeBSD project. So what is FreeBSD? It is one of the oldest, largest, and most successful open source projects in the world. It's a complete operating system. So what I mean by that is, that, so when you think of FreeBSD in, in Linux, um, I mean, just the, the name Linux is very prevalent and people will refer to their operating systems as Linux, but when you're running it on your computer, it's a, it's a distribution. So it's taking Linux, which is the kernel, and wrapping around the user land and tools and the documentation, whatever else you need to make it a complete operating system. And FreeBSD is that complete operating system. 
and we support over 33,000 third-party software or open source packages. And so what that means is that when you're setting up your desktop to use FreeBSD and, and you want an editor or you want to be able to get your email or access the internet, then you can install those different software packages that support those applications that you need. It's supported by thousands of contributors as well as hundreds of developers. And, and the difference there is really, so a developer is referred to someone who can actually commit a code or documentation to the tree. And we run on all different platforms. And so, um, and so all, all the current CPUs as well as the, the newer CPUs uh, that are out there as well as uh, in the cloud, all the main cloud providers. And there really are tens of millions of deployed systems out there. This is an abridged version of um, you know, FreeBSD's history. And, um, and I, I created it just to like really show this high level view of how FreeBSD descended from the original Unix. And we have, this is also a, a shortened version of the timeline that we created and put on our website. And I would encourage people to go there and if, um, I think, I believe my mouse shows up on this and uh, this URL right here on the bottom left, that will take you to our timeline. And it's, it's really a fun way to learn the history uh, of FreeBSD as well as the start of Unix. And, and so in here, it's showing how Unix started in 1969. It was developed at Bell Labs. In 1974, uh, it went to Berkeley. I mean, it didn't move to Berkeley, but uh, Berkeley started working on Unix and they were contributing um, you know, features and fixing bugs and everything and doing a lot of work there. And, and then it wasn't, it wasn't until 1992 that the first really truly unencumbered um, you know, open source version of the operating system was made available. And then in that same year then, um, or actually the, the next year is when um, you know, FreeBSD and NetBSD were um, you know, turned into separate projects. And in between that time here on the left, I, I highlight that there was a lawsuit uh, from AT&T to, um, to Berkeley, as well as a company called BSDI. And, um, and, and I pointed out because it did slow down uh, you know, the progress and the development of FreeBSD during those few years. And, and the reason why I highlight it is just that people will ask, well, why why did Linux take off and FreeBSD didn't? And it was right at that time that the developers of FreeBSD, um, people from Berkeley, they were tied up in this lawsuit. And so it, it was very difficult to move forward and do much innovation at that time. And so, um, you know, is that the reason? It's, that's you know, an assumption. And, uh, but that was at the same time that Linux came out. But FreeBSD has been around for 27 years and there's been a lot of growth and innovation over that time. So I don't know how hard it is to see um, on your computers, but I love to use this chart that you could find on the Unix wiki page. And the reason why I show it is to show not only all the uses that came about from Unix, from proprietary operating systems to open source ones. But you can see that FreeBSD's lineage does come from the original Unix. And, and that's what I'm trying to show here. Uh, but the other thing too is all the main computer and computing companies back in the day all used a version of Unix from IBM to HP to Sun. And in fact, when I started out after college, I was using IBM's version of Unix, and that's what I learned before um, MS-DOS was introduced to us. And here, what I do is I'm just focusing more on the open source side and highlighting here how FreeBSD did descend from the original Unix. 
And the reason why there's these quirky paths here too is it's, it is because of um, the licensing from at t at the time and as well as the, um, the lawsuit and how FreeBSD as well as NetBSD, uh, once the lawsuit was resolved, they had actually back out to a different version of BSD at the time. And here over on the left, you see Linux um, started, you know, it was uh, uh, created to uh, as a version of Minix, its own version of Minix, and it started right around the same time as FreeBSD. And so, and like I said, you can find this little flowchart on the unix.org website. So he uses FreeBSD. So what I'm showing here isn't just the only companies that use FreeBSD. What I'm highlighting here are the marquee companies, companies that you would recognize that are successfully using FreeBSD. And so this is really just a small handful of companies out there that use FreeBSD. And really, most likely you're using FreeBSD. So if you're using an iPhone or an Apple computer, the Mac OS was based originally on mostly BSD and most and a lot of that was replaced with FreeBSD over, over time. If you're watching a movie on Netflix, that content that you're actually streaming, that's all run on a FreeBSD servers. And, and so on. And, and Sony PlayStation is another one that um, is pretty, is a um, prevalent use of FreeBSD. So why should you use FreeBSD? Uh, when someone asks me that, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the community that um, I really view it as a friendly and approachable community. Uh, and um, and I say that because in my position as someone who's not directly contributing to the code um, or the project, um, I see, I do read the mailing list. I do watch, um, I, I watch the forums, I uh, watch mailing lists and, um, and it's not really, it's not to spy on the project, it's really to understand, understand the questions that are coming in to understand uh, concerns and um, and and definitely there's I would say it's not perfect it's there's definitely heated conversations that go on um, but most of the time people are uh, respectful of each other uh, but what I find the most are when new people join that there's always people that will step in and answer questions in a really um, positive way FreeBSD is known for its excellent documentation and so not only do you get documentation when you install the the operating system, so it's available right there, but um, you Google something and you'll find how to do something or what something means. And, and I know, because I'm doing that all the time. Um, the tooling is, is modern and um, we're supporting a whole new uh, you know, tool chain that's uh, non-GPL uh, that um, has been really, um, helpful for uh, like universities that are doing research and work with um, operating systems. And, and we do follow a consistent development release process. And a lot of that came out of, of the project that worked on, B, on BSC out of Berkeley. And because it was um, not only established way, but it was, um, you know, the project was successful. And so, um, so it's changed over time, but um, you know things have only improved um, based on you know a really solid foundation of development. And like I said earlier, it's a wide variety of architectures that are supported. And probably the biggest thing that stands out with the difference between FreeBSD and other operating systems is the the license. And so it's a, referred to as a permissive license. And um, what that means is that. Uh, you can make changes and you're not required to, um, to give them back. So actually companies that do do, um, you know, have their own secret sauce, their own IP in the code, they aren't required to give it back. And that's why you'll find uh, that there's a lot of companies that do like to use a FreeBSD because of that. And it is really secure, stable, and reliable. It's, um, it's a whole philosophy that the project follows. 
that makes it that way. So next I'm going to go into how the project works. And um, I do want you to feel free to, you know, if, if as I'm going along, if you have questions um, about what I'm talking about, please feel free to put it in the chat window and um, I'd be happy to try to answer it. Uh, so anyway, so the project is, um, it's built of people from all over the world. And so, uh, which is really cool because you have all these different perspectives that people are bringing and experiences that people are bringing into the project. Uh, so the project is independent of the foundation, like I was explaining earlier, and it's managed um, I want to use like the word manage with quotes around that, but it, it's a core team of nine people and, um, and, and they're the ones who like direct, oversee, manage the project. And I'll go in a little more detail in a second. Uh, you can commit code um, by becoming a committer and it's a whole mentorship process. And so, um, so when you're, you, after you've been contributing, patches for a while and someone sees your work and sees um, your interest, then they may step in and volunteer to be your mentor. And it's a great way to start committing changes, but having someone there to help guide you and also review your changes. So if you're new and you're a little hesitant and nervous about contributing, contributing to this old project, um, where you have so many you know, people who are already expert in, experts in different areas. Um, your mentor is really responsible for your, your commits. So um, if you mess up, which is fine, that's how we learn. Um, it's actually your mentor that takes responsibility for that. So, so it's nice, so it's a nice bridge. And, um, and it is a collaborative development environment. So um, an example of that might be that you have an idea of something you want to change and uh, you can run it by people within the community and get their, their feedback to help. So this is my org chart of the project. I try to visualize how it works and really if it was true, I would have um, I'd have a ton of blocks, red blocks on the bottom, and but since that would be really messy and ugly, I, I put a lot of the teams in just bullets down the bottom. Well, what I'm trying to show here is how um, you know FreeBSD and the FreeBSD project are separate, but we're there. We're there to to help, to step in, to help fill fill uh, critical needs of the project. And then you have the core team, which could be viewed as board of directors of the project or the high level managers. And then you have these functional teams underneath. And the teams are what help um, you know, different areas of the project. For example, we have a security team, uh, we have the ports management team. And the nice thing about having, putting different responsibilities in, in these buckets is that it gives um, first, these teams have a list of their responsibilities, um, and so they know what they're supposed to be doing as far as supporting the, that area of the project. But it also gives people who want to contribute to the project an area to get involved with. So they might be, be providing their own skills and experience to one of these teams, or they may actually want to gain skills and experience in one of these areas. And so it's a great way to be able to participate in a specific area of the project. Now, when you are a committer, uh, you don't have to be on one of these teams. So the core team I've mentioned a few times, and yeah, um, is it's an elected body of, of people from the project. They have to be committers. And, um, and they're elected by the committers on the project. And we have, um, I can't remember what the number is right now, but I wanna say we have around 400 actual committers on the project. And we just went through the elections and that was about, um, I think it took place like maybe four or five weeks ago. And there's a whole set of bylaws. You can find out the process online. If you search FreeBSD core team bylaws, you'll find it. And now I'll explain the process. And, um, and here's a list of 
sort of a high level list of what they're responsible for, but it is to help provide direction of the project as well as helping with um, you know, developer relationships and conflict resolutions. And, um, and so they're the people you go to for that or the people who will step in to help with that. And um, yeah, in the bottom bullet I have is just to point out that we don't have one person who is in charge of the project who um, has the final say of, of what happens. This graph, uh, we pulled the data last year, uh, and so I'd really love to update this, but it's, but it's when I think of all the people on the project or the committers at least, um, it's still distributed pretty similarly. And, uh, and what we're showing here is that uh, we're bringing in new people. We have, uh, which, will, which really helps us the sustainability of the project. Um, it also shows on, on the right end that we have, um, I want to say more experienced people. <laughs> uh, I mean, since it shows their age, uh, we have older people. But the beauty of that is that uh, most of those people um, bring such experience and knowledge to the project, and they're so willing to help. And, um, and so it's so important to have that too. And, um, and then we have it, the, the middle um, lines where it's, it's just really showing that uh, we, ha we have a great age distribution and level of from you know, new person out of college or even in college, we do have uh, quite a few interns um, you know, to people who are actively contributing and who have that um, you know, sort of world or um, you know, job experience that's contributing to the project. The, um, so continuing on how the project works, uh, we follow the, uh, the POLA principle, which is the principle of least astonishment. And really what that means is don't make a change just to make a change. You make a change because um, you're adding a feature that will benefit FreeBSD. You're, uh, fixing a you know security issue you're um, you're improving the performance you you think through the change before you do it and like I said earlier a lot of times people will run these ideas by people you know certain people within the project to get their feedback and uh, and so because of following that that philosophy or principle then it allows um, FreeBSD to continue to be you know, stable and, and reliable and secure too. We have uh, two different types of releases. We have a major release and the point release. And, um, and so a major release would be, for example, when we came out with 12.0 and uh, we'll be coming out with 13.0 uh, mid-year next year, I believe. And, um, and so those are major releases you have. Uh, that's where like if, a, if there's a big change that will go in a new feature, um, it may be held off for, for a major release like that. And then the point release are smaller changes, um, you know, errata, um, security issues that will be uh, rolled in. And so those happen more often. And so we just had the 11.4 release and 12.2 uh, is coming up. And you can find out more about releases too uh, if you go to freebsc.org. And, um, and then there's two types of branches. There's the current and stable. And so uh, if you make a change and you commit it, it will go to current and uh, changes will move to stable once they've been um, you know, tested and, um, and, and proved that they're, um, that they're okay to go into a stable branch. So that's, that's how the releases work. So how uh, you contribute to FreeBSD uh, you could do it by writing code. Uh, documentation is a great way to get started to contribute, uh, maintaining ports, and um, as well as advocacy. A lot of people actually um, do various ways of advocacy for FreeBSD from uh, like videos. Uh, there's been some great, fun videos, interesting, informative videos out there that people, various people 
uh, from the community produce. Um, there are people who have Twitter handles that are out there to help people with uh, free BSD. Uh, people go to uh, conferences around the world and they may teach workshops or give presentations. So there's a lot of ways you can contribute that way. And it is easy to get started contributing. So uh, some suggestions, suggestions would be to um, start with documentation. I think that's one of the easiest places to get started. And you could uh, translate into your own la your native language. You can um, improve our documentation. There's always areas that could be either clarified more, explained more, better, um, or even like grammatical errors in there. Uh, you could pick a port to maintain or add, and uh, you could look at our bug list and and uh, fix a bug. And um, so I'm gonna actually do show you where you can go. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Um, Oh, I have to hit share. <laughs> um, this is sort of a cool thing about doing a, a webinar uh, is that I can, it's easier for me to like go back and forth between doing a presentation as well as showing you um, interesting or informative information from the, um, from the internet. So, so anyway, so this is a great page for uh, new people. And, um, and you get this from the homepage when on FreeBSD.org on, uh, I think that's a button called New to FreeBSD. And, and this helps getting you started with FreeBSD. And like, so for example, after this webinar and you wanna find out more about FreeBSD, you can go to this website and it'll talk to you about uh, or explain how you can get FreeBSD and, um, and installed on your computer. Um, learning about FreeBSD, how we have the handbook, which is really informative. Uh, we have, there's an FAQ page. Um, there's also different forums for um, asking questions and getting information from forums to different mailing lists. Um, and then uh, there's different like FreeBSD derived or distributed projects that you can learn more about. And then to me, the place where I think you should go after looking here is under here, under the how to contribute. And then here on the bottom, if you click on contributing to FreeBSD, this article, which has been, has gotten input from a lot of people, actually people on the top here have, or some of the um, original people from the project. And, but you've it, but over time we've had other people step in to update and improve this document. But but this is really nice because it it starts it, it tells you like what is needed on the project, and to give you an idea of um, you know what if you have some expertise in an area you might be able to contribute there, um, and then also like I said earlier about like um, going through the the bugs. Uh, the bug list and um, how you can maybe you know, look at that and resolve help resolve some of the bugs uh, if you're looking at ports you can do that um, and then there's a lot of items down here of um, other ideas of what you could do so so I would highly suggest going to uh, this page and um, learning more about how you contribute now that's fantastic, see. Deb. Um, that's a great uh, link to have too. And if it's not at the end of your presentation, I'll definitely add it to the email um, that goes out to everyone after. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be great. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to go back to here to. Okay, so I covered that. So now talking about why companies use FreeBSD. Um, I won't go through this whole list, but the things, the items that really stand out of when we talk to companies, uh, the license uh, is a big reason why companies will use FreeBSD, the history of FreeBSD, as well as all the innovation that's happened over the years uh, with 
not only the 27 years of previous D, but even the history before that. And, um, and actually ZFS is a big reason why companies use FreeBSD and we're active in the OpenZFS project and community. And here's a list of you know, how FreeBSD is, is used for different applications. And um, so, since I mentioned earlier that I'm not really very technical in operating systems, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but, um, but there are other ways to find out more information about FreeBSD. In fact, it was, I don't know if you can see this, so it depends on how big your window is for the video, but I would highly recommend this book, and I have it in the resource pages at the end too, if you, really, if you want to understand the internals of, the, of FreeBSD. I've read um, maybe the first quarter of it, so which is it's it's good. It's very well written and um, and interesting, and it talks about the history at the beginning, and so um, and so that's really interesting too. But this is more like um, this list are, is really the, the basic functions that a kernel needs to be supporting, and so we do we we support all of that plus um, you know making sure that we work on. Um, all the modern CPUs as well as the, the newer architectures that they're coming out with. And then the same thing with the user line. It's, um, it's you know, they, they focus on the consistency of it and it's integrated with the kernel. And so you have the same team that's working on, working on and testing the whole package. So, um, so it's a very coherent, uh, system. And some of the features that stand out in FreeBSD, uh, the file systems, and like I said, that we're um, heavily involved with the OpenCFS project. And we're currently, actually the foundation is currently funding a few projects right now to add some improvements. And, um, and actually one of the um, our more experienced um, Developers who you know was when it was uh, uh, one of the original developers of one of the file systems and also one of the original uh, BSD developers back in uh, the day it was at Berkeley and he's still heavily involved in our project and he's actually on our board of directors too so um, so it's really helpful having him and he and he still I guess talks on file systems and um, as well as the history of FreeBSD. Uh, Dtrace, uh, that's also a very popular uh, feature. And, um, and so it's performance analysis uh, tool that's real time. Our jails were, um, you know, that's like the first containerization that was developed back in the early 2000s, as well as um, it, they're still heavily used. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we have our own hypervisor called Beehive, and uh, the TCP IP stack was originally developed at, um, through, or you know, when it was BSD, uh, but it's continually being improved um, in FreeBSD, and it's also used as a reference um, you know, network stack for other protocols, and um, and then Capsicum, which is a, a security and a capability type of framework that came out of um, University of Cambridge, which is actually, that's a really good example of a university that is doing a lot of research with uh, FreeBSD and, and actually they're doing a lot of uh, some new collaborative work with ARM, which is really exciting. So, um, Deb, if I could yeah. interrupt for a minute, sure. um, what are the most sought um, sought after kind of technical skills when looking at a potential contributor. So going back to um, how to become a contributor to FreeBSD and more specifically, what are the top programming languages are, are people looking for? Oh, that's a really good question because I don't know uh, if I can answer the programming question right now. Um, and it's funny because I was going to look that up. I mean, C, C and C++ are the two primary ones I would say right now. Um, that's, uh, and 
Python, maybe another one, but now I'm sort of guessing at that. Um, and it, yeah, that's a question I, I, I should have the answer for, but I'll, I'll actually uh, try to post that somewhere. Um, as far as skills, really, uh, the beauty of open source is that there's so many opportunities for um, whether you have skills or not. And, and that's why I was saying documentation is, uh, it's probably the best path to take as far as getting involved. And so even, so say you're a com computer science student um, and you know, and you know, see, you still may want to start with documentation because it's a great way to understand the technology and uh, you can work like on a man page and explain a feature uh, or a command or something. And, um, and so it helps give you that path, that learning path to then start contributing uh, you know, code and, um, and find out what area you're interested in. And, um, but, but people, I mean, we really try to promote that working on FreeBSD as well as open source projects is a good way to gain like marketable skills. So, um, and, and actually I'll, I'll cover on that a little bit later. I, I do have a slide about like some of those skills that you gain. So, but I'll, I'll try to um, answer the programming language later too. That's um, great. And then I don't know. So someone was asking about yeah, the book. And I don't know. I don't know if you can see that because I know I have a reflection here. I will make sure to add that book title into the email as well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, and also and I have a resource slide at the end. And so I'll um, and so it's included there too. Yeah. So and so continuization. Um, so I just try to. Uh, Put together a list of some of the um, solutions out there, and um, ah, okay. Can you hear me still? Yep, absolutely. Okay, because I think um, my battery is dying on my headset, so if I have a problem, I may have to actually connect power. Um, okay, so so just let me know if if you can't hear me anymore. Um, and I might be able to switch it to a different uh, mic too. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, there's different, actually someone just pointed out that I did not include, um, there's another containerization solution out there called uh, CBSD and, uh, and that is valid that um, I should have added that here. I was trying to really off the top of my head come up with a list of uh, ones that I was, that I could think of. And so I will definitely add that to this list, but these are different solutions. Uh, for containerization out there. Uh, we are funding a project right now to improve the Linux later, and that's a way to run uh, Linux binaries. And so uh, if people really truly want to run Docker, then that would be a way to do, um, to be able to run uh, Docker. Um, okay, so we will move on. So the foundation is what I run, and uh, we were founded uh, March 2000, and um, we are a 501c3, which is a uh, nonprofit, a public nonprofit, and um, and the reason why I put that out, and that's a United States clarification or tax clarification, and the reason why I point that out is because, um, I mean, so when you see a foundation and people will call, will say, um, you know, I we're a foundation, we're a nonprofit, but there's a difference in the US that uh, depends on how you're classified. And so we're for the public good, but there are other foundations that are uh, like a 501c6 and, and they're still a nonprofit, uh, but they're a trade association. And so their purpose is to support companies out there. And so a good um, example of that would be the Linux Foundation. And so uh, they're a membership organization and their purpose is to support the uh, companies out there that are using Linux and open source. And so, um, so I'm just pointing that out to differentiate. We're based here in uh, Boulder, Colorado. So that's where um, I am working from right now. And we are 100% funded by donations. So uh, I also include that just so you understand how we get our funding. And um, if you're benefiting from FreeBSD to, you know, 
please consider making a donation or if your employer is benefiting, if you could um, help be our voice and ask for a financial contribution so we can continue this work. And, um, and really our whole purpose is to support FreeBSD, the community and the project. And okay, can you, and you can still hear me, right, Caitlin? This is telling me to read. Yep. Okay. Yep, that's good. Okay. I do know I will get my, I don't know if this will reach. I've never run in the situation of my headset dying, but anyway, okay. Um, and so our purpose is to, um, you know, step in to uh, fill, help fill critical needs of the project. So a lot of times I give this talk to Linux conferences and what I'm showing here is you know, how, why we should work together. And so the we is between FreeBSD and Linux. And, um, and obviously I'm, I'm trying to get people to use and you know, contribute to FreeBSD, but it's just as a learning uh, basis for foundation, I, I really believe it's important to understand multiple operating systems more than just what you're working on. That's how you learn. Uh, we learn from each other. We all make mistakes and we all have successes. And so, um, so we could definitely learn from working together. Um, also, one thing I want to point out too is I don't mean work together as far as like coding together because we're totally different operating systems. But we could see a feature that you may have, you know, implemented. Maybe we should too. And so, so that's why you should watch what you know each other is doing. Uh, we have different coding method methodologies and philosophies. And so understanding why one chooses one over the other, the pros and cons, that's really helpful. And um, you know, FreeBSD is a much smaller code base. And so it's a really great reference platform. It's a good learning tool. Um, I mean, if you compare uh, FreeBSD and Linux, like if, so just the, the kernel size, because that's the only thing you can really compare, uh, FreeBSD is about five and a half million lines of code. And Linux is, um, I think they're at like 37,000 um, million or million, 37 million lines of code. So it's a much, you know, smaller amount of code, lines of code to, uh, to learn from. So that's why it's a great uh, learning tool. And the last line is, is something I, I read online of someone who, um, was talking about FreeBSD and it really resonated with me that just by using FreeBSD made them a better Linux, um, you know, sysadmin and, and systems engineer. So I, I think that's really um, important. So why should you contribute to FreeBSD? Um, and, and I think this is uh, a question that came in earlier, um, but really to be part of a, um, you know, inclusive and welcoming community. And um, with the strong mentoring culture. So I, like I said earlier, how to get your commitment, you, you get a, um, you get a mentor. And so that's a big part of the philosophy. Uh, like I just mentioned, it's a great way to, to learn about operating systems and it's a great way to learn systems programming too. Uh, the size of the project really allows you to step in and make a, a notable impact to the project. So there's a lot of opportunities with it, within the project to do that. And, um, and we really need people to step in to help in all these different areas. And, um, and when I was talking about some of the older, more experienced people too, this is where it's like you have a lot of the more notable BSD and FreeBSD founders who are still involved in the project and they're very approachable. And, um, and it is democratically run. So, um, so it's easier to get your changes um, you know, accepted. When earlier I was talking about how uh, the community is helpful and I was watching um, and I watch, you know, social media and some of the mailing lists. And these are two um, responses that really stood out to me. They're from the, the same, um, you know, Twitter handle, but it shows what I'm showing here is like in the left one, this person talks about how they're new and they'll make, you know, they know that they've made some stupid mistakes and have asked foolish questions. And that's how we always feel when we're new to something. 
And, you know, you step in and you, you don't know if you want to ask because you're going to be embarrassed. Is this really a stupid question? And, you know, and this person stepped in and they said, there's no stupid questions. And really try to welcome this person and make sure they know that, you know, that you can't ask the questions. And I'm here. There's other people here, too, who um, will help and, and answer it if we can. And then the one on the right, I actually just saw this morning. And, um, and it just stood out because this person posted that they, um, that they just contributed their first uh, port contribution. And here, this previous e person you know, congratulated them. And I see this person do this a lot. And I think it's really cool. And, um, and then you can see the rest of the conversation that went on here. And so it's just someone who is part of the community who wants to step in and help. Uh, here I'm trying to, uh, people ask about using it on the desktop, um, and I list some reasons here why, um, you know, why you might want to uh, use FreeBSD on your, or why and how. Um, there's some distributions here on the right that you may want to check out. Uh, the nice thing about those is they'll have like the desktop integrated. They make the installation a little bit easier. and um, and so it, so it might be an easier way to get started. And we also have a comparison that we wrote up from the foundation. And it's really just a, it's not to say uh, to compare good, good versus bad, but uh, just what the differences are. So, um, so previously it wasn't developed for the desktop, but a lot of people do use it. And, um, and we are trying to actually get better at supporting a newer hardware and we have people who are working on that so um, because we do recognize that I mean we're all I, I'm not my computer I'm using right now is not FreeBSD but I do run it on a virtual machine and I have another laptop here that is FreeBSD based that I that I do use. So um, to sort of end this what I mean the next step would be to try FreeBSD and so uh, the easiest way would be to either install a virtual machine, like I always use VirtualBox, but there's a lot of cloud providers out there that um, do run FreeBSD, and this is a list here, and you could go to FreeBSD.org and click on the download FreeBSD, and we also have how-to guides on how to get started. And um, the other thing I was going to cover was, so this is being uh, run by LPI, Linux Professional Institute, and they offer the BSD Specialist um, uh, Certificate. And I would suggest going, I'm going to do the share screen again, or I know I'm sharing it, but different screen. And go here, and not that page, but to this page. And so you can go to this page, and um, and they break it out by objectives. And um, when I started looking at those, because I wasn't real familiar with how they did the BSC certification. And but what I was impressed by was um, that it gave you this checklist to follow that. I mean, this is what the test covers. But it's also. Um, a checklist that you could follow for learning FreeBSD. And I thought this is a great way because I'm always playing around with FreeBSD and trying to learn more. And I was thinking this would have been a great way. Actually, this is a great way to just start from the beginning and follow, you know, and just follow each topic or objective within the, the test to learn FreeBSD. And so you learn about, you know, package management in one section. Um, you know, startup configuration. And, um, and so this is something that I will probably follow just to go through this. And so I can learn more and, and understand this, this process a little bit better. So anyway, so I thought that this, um, this was a really good uh, learning tool. So let's see here, I will go back to, um,
Okay, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, because it told me it went away. <laughs> so now I'm connected. Now I'm connected to power. Okay. Um, so this was the resource page that I was talking about. So I have here, so the um, we refer to it as the DNI book. This is the book over here on the top left that is uh, an Oh, Deb, we can't hear you um, right now. Just give Deb one minute here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, absolutely. Okay, <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. I had to switch um, the source. Okay, so um, so this was all I had, but here I'm going to go over the resource page a little bit more. Um, we have a link, and, and, may, and we may uh, include the slide in the email that Caitlin was talking about. Uh, what I tried to include here were things that I had covered in the talk. And um, so the history, this is Kirk McCusick, who is one of the original BSD developers and is still uh, participates and well contributes to the project. And he talks about the history here and it's so interesting, especially if you watch one of his videos. And, um, and so he's, he's fun to watch and um, has a lot of information. And the handbook, is a really good resource for uh, learning about FreeBSD. And, it, and it's funny because you think of it like it's, it, it, you know, it's a technical manual in a way, but it's, but it's really informative, really easy to read, and it's written by the community. And so I have actually sat down and read through it. And, and I can do it because it is information. It is interesting. Um, the middle book, The Absolute FreeBSD, um, that's also a must-have book. If you're going to get two books, I would recommend the two books I have listed here. And, uh, and that's more from like sysadmin perspective, um, how to use FreeBSD. And then on the right is we actually have a, a magazine called the FreeBSD Journal. The foundation um, publishes this. And, um, and so it has really informative articles and we do post all the art, it is free and we do have all the articles on the website and this is the URL for that. And then the last thing here I included was the foundation has um, spent a lot of time putting together how-to guides. And so you can uh, find out like just even how to install FreeBSD on uh, VirtualBox and to setting up a Minecraft server. So there's a lot of different how-to guides that we provide there. And we just updated to, um, we have, sometimes we'll hold install fests. And so we have a, a two-part uh, two install fest or getting started with FreeBSD that we've just updated and that's available there. And, um, and one thing that we're going to do, we haven't announced this yet. So gosh, if my marketing director is watching, then I'll probably get in trouble. But uh, we're going to kick off a, a FreeBSD Friday series. It's a FreeBSD 101 type of series. Uh, 101 refers to it being more introductory. And what the goal is, is every Friday, and we'll probably start this in mid-July, because we're still planning this, but we'll have um, introduction, introductory um, topic talks from like just like this one, introduction of FreeBSD to uh, introduction of file systems, introduction of ports and packages, uh, security. We'll have an install fest too, and they'll all be uh, live streamed. And so, so they'll be uh, similar to this format, and and that's really to you know, help just educate people and, um, 
and a way for people to keep in touch with FreeBSD who are, um, you know, when we, especially now that we can't do things in person, it's a way for us to uh, stay connected. So that's about all I have. I think my time that's is up to you. Um, yeah, we do have a couple questions, um, if you wouldn't mind. So um, we have one here. Will FreeBSD adopt uh, Docker? How about orchestration like um, K8 and others? The, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, most like there are people who are working on like a Docker port and that's that's part of just uh, people who are interested in that in the project. Um, the current solution right now is um, is for Docker to run um, on like the Linux elator or in a VM if needed. Um, orchestration. I, I, now I'm not sure if Ansible is a similar thing or not because um, I know a lot of people use that. As far as the Kubernetes, uh, right now, I don't believe anything is currently being worked on for that support. So th that's definitely an area where, um, you know, I, I know where this question is coming from, um, and that's something that I could probably uh, provide a, a better answer, um, you know, in a little bit on over social media, or if there's going to be a, a place where I can provide answers through LPI. Okay, great. Uh, what programming languages and programming environments does FreeBSD support? Um, there was a, someone heard about Java support issues in FreeBSD for production. Does that issue solved or still exist? Oh wait, the, the question was that there were Java issues? There was, yeah, they heard about um, there may be some Java support issues. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm not aware of the issues. Um, we did actually recently fund a project to support OpenJDK. And um, so, I mean, my answer right now is I'm not aware of any problems. It doesn't mean that there aren't problems. Um, if it's something that you are aware of, uh, you could always uh, send me an email and we'll have that in the email that Caitlin sends out, as well as yep. you can actually tweet that question to you. Okay, perfect. I do, I do see one question here. It's um, asking if there's anyone from Africa. Um, yeah. What's the diversity? Because I think I, I do think that's a really important question. Um, we we do have uh, one person who has been traveling to Africa, um, various. Um, areas within Africa uh, to give uh, free BSD talks and workshops, and um, and that's something that we've been doing in other sort of more underrepresented countries, and um, and so that's I mean he so he's one person who, who I'm aware of who's doing that. Actually, uh, we do assist sometimes with his travel because. Um, because of his qualifications and willingness uh, to go to certain countries. Uh, we've actually, in our past, we have conferences, BSD conferences around the world, and there's one held in Europe every year in different uh, countries within Europe. And, um, and so the last few years, we've actually had, um, I think three, and three is like a small number, but three people from Nigeria who've attended and they want to start, um, I think one want to start a company and uh, two or more at the university level starting uh, user groups. And um, so it's a small number, but also when you look at the attendance at our conferences, um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, two to 300 attendees. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so that would be more specific to Africa and um, and I can't remember what countries he's been in there. And um, but it isn't something that we do want to improve on. I have been focusing on women, bringing more women into the project, um, and recognize that it is something. And that's because it's a personal interest. Because as a female engineer, um, I for a long time have been interested in 
sparking the interest in girls to get into some type of STEM uh, career. And, um, but it's something that we really need to expand to, uh, you, you know, more than just gender. And it's something that uh, we in the foundation are, you know, looking into and what we could do. So, uh, so we definitely want to make the project more uh, diverse and, um, and welcoming to all people. So it, it's definitely something that we're looking at how we can do it, but it takes time and we want to make, you know, do it. We want to do it. We don't want just it to be a superficial thing. We want, I mean, we really want people, um, I mean, it's so important to, be a diverse community. And we're diverse as far as culture, <laughs> but uh, there's so many different aspects of that. So thank you for that question too. Wonderful. And let's, uh, last question here. Um, is there a desktop version of FreeBSD for newbies who wants to give it a try? Um, they know that FreeBSD is not for desktop OS, but they're using it since 2005. Um, but they have a hard time introducing it to newbies as they prefer desktop version to give it a try. Oh, for newbies. Mm -hmm. um, what I, I, I would, from that list that I had, um, actually I can go back. There we go. Um, what, so out of the list I have here on the right, I don't have experience in any of them. So, um, but what I would say is that, uh, so Fury is a newer distribution. Uh, Midnight and Ghost have been around longer and um, I would probably try one of those. Uh, Nomad is more for, uh, uh, as the name implies, it's a, like a flash, you put it on a flash. And so it's meant to be more portable. Um, and I don't know um, what they've done as far as the GUI, yeah, but that, um, and so someone actually put a comment here that they've used Ghost and they would recommend it. So that's why we started putting that, that list together, the URL in the bottom right um, of the slide is, I, I basically had someone who wasn't experienced with any of these and I put a guide together on what, you know, sort of like, what's the purpose of each one and um, you know and what features does it provide and so then it gives you that information so you can make that decision yourself so um, so this person who just said that they use ghost bsd i know that they're new they've been recently learning free bsd um, just because this person's reached out to me with questions in the past and um, so i you know, I, I might try that. I, I guess if I were to try, I'd probably try Ghost and Midnight first. Um, really interested in, in Fury and watching what they're doing. And because uh, I always, I always like seeing people try new things. And what a great way to try, you know, you have this foundation and FreeBSD. And so you have sort of like the scaffolding already successfully built for you. And um, so now I want to create my own desktop or my own something. And so now you use this, you don't have to develop the operating system anymore. And, and I could play around with it and build what I want. So, um, so that's why I, I love seeing these new, um, you know, projects come about because it shows that someone is really passionate about this. And that's what makes open source successful is that you have the people, you have the passion and, um, and it may not succeed, but they learn and, and you learn. So if you try desktop and you find, well, it didn't do what I wanted or something. You so see, you, so then you learn that you learn, well, I really want a desktop that does this, that provides no, that provides KDA, KD, that, makes it easy for me just to get started, then you, you could ask too, you know, on Twitter. Um, that's actually a great way to ask. There's also a Facebook page called um, FreeBSD Users. And I have found that's, that's a place where people go to ask questions and they may be really simple and basic questions. 
and someone will always step in and give them the answer. Or they may tell them how to find that answer, um, but they do it in a really constructive way. They don't, um, yeah, they may say, oh, you'll find that in handbook, search for blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they'll, they'll help them, they'll help guide them. So, um, you know, with enough information so this person can also learn how to find information too on their own. But, but I would definitely recommend that Facebook page to follow. And we'll, I'll try to make sure that's on the resource page too.